Hello, everyone, and welcome to Depth Insights, where we take a depth psychological look at news and events going on in your world. I'm your host, Bonnie Bright, and I'm also the founder of Depth Psychology Alliance, which is a free online community for everyone who's interested in depth and union psychologies. And I'm really excited to be here today with my guest, Steve Buser, who is a psychiatrist and also the founder of the Asheville Jung Center, and also the editor of a new book, which we'll be talking about in just a moment. Hi, Steve. Thanks for being with me. Hello, thank you. I'm delighted to be here as well today. Yeah, it's great to have you here. We are going to be talking about a topic that could be considered kind of controversial, I think, but is one that is actually very critically relevant to everybody right now, not just the deaf and union communities, of course. And that is somewhat around the topic of the election, but also around a figure who has been fairly controversial, and that is Donald Trump. So we'll get more into that. Let me just share a bit more about Steve so that everybody understands more about his background. And then I'll also give you a description of the book and then we'll go ahead and launch in. Mm -hmm. So Stephen Buser, MD, trained in medicine at Duke University and served 12 years as a physician in the US Air Force. He's a graduate of a two-year clinical training program at the C.G. Jung Institute of Chicago and is the co-founder of the Asheville Jung Center, as I mentioned. In addition to a busy psychiatric private practice, he serves as publisher of Chiron Publications. And Steve has just recently co-edited a book called A Clear and Present Danger, Narcissism in the Era of Donald Trump. And he co-edited that with Leonard Cruz, which um, some of you might know as well. And so, <laughs> Steve, this is, a, this is a big topic, and as I mentioned, highly relevant. And you and I have just had some conversation around how this came out in, a, in such a timely way, according to how the election is proceeding. So I'd like to dig into that a little bit. First, I think it would be a good idea if we just discuss a little bit about what the book is, and maybe that includes what the book is not. So mm -hmm. I'm going to just read a short segment about the description of the book, and then I will let you go and just elaborate a bit more on, on that. Yeah, certainly. Okay, great. So A Clear and Present Danger. Narcissism in the Era of Donald Trump brings together best-selling authors, university professors, and practicing clinicians. And there's this quote by Alexis de Tocqueville. It says, every country has a government it deserves. Whatever history eventually records about the 2016 presidential election, this frank and thoughtful exploration of narcissism will prove to be a timely and timeless study. So, Steve, I just wanted to start off by talking about the word narcissism, because that is very obviously in the title. It does say narcissism in the era of Donald Trump. I know everybody's tendency is going to be to leap to Donald Trump, and I think that that's probably a very valid response, uh, particularly given the, the kind of media coverage that his campaign has had and that he as a, an individual has had. But <sighs> let's talk about narcissism first, because there is such a thing as healthy narcissism. Can you talk about how you would define narcissism and maybe share a little bit about the differences between healthy and maybe unhealthy narcissism? Yeah, well, thank you. That's not a bad place to jump into the book with that. The first part of what you mentioned is really important, that the book is and isn't about Donald Trump. The book is really about narcissism. The book was written by 18 different psychiatrists, psychologists, and a couple university professors looking at narcissism, but we can't deny that it's in the middle of the 2016 presidential campaign and Donald Trump you know, really has stirred a lot of emotions you know, along those lines. So while the first third of the book is indeed a fair amount about Donald Trump, you know, much of the book is about narcissism in itself. When you define narciss narcissism, of course, there's different ways of, of doing so. There's the very dry clinical DSM-5 you know, approach, and I brought our other book. This is the other book we published. We published two books <laughs> that Len and I have co-written. This one is a primer on DSM-5. We published it shortly after DSM-5 came out, and in the book we look at really all the psychiatric diagnoses, but of course narcissism included. Our main focus of that book was more about uh, the spectrum of illness. That is not whether we have bipolar disorder or don't have bipolar, but all of us have a level of bipolarity on some level, and it's just weird we fall on the spectrum of bipolarity. The narcissism, though from DSM-5, you can look it up. If you Google DSM-5 narcissistic personality disorder, you'll quickly find nine diagnostic criterion, and you can just list those nine from grandiosity to lack of empathy to fantasies of unlimited power to envy towards others. And it's tempting to take that template of those nine characteristics and apply them to 
anybody, a spouse, a friend, ourselves, or a presidential candidate and, and try to diagnose or not diagnose them. And that was one piece we tried very hard not to do on a full direct level, you know, with Mr. Trump or really any you know, candidate. We do talk a lot about what Donald Trump has said, a lot of direct quotations from him that appear as if they line up with the DSM-5 diagnostic criterion. But if you really drill down into those criterion, the majority of those are all internal criterion, with one or two exceptions with that, meaning grandiosity, that if Donald Trump has or doesn't have grandiosity, it's a internal sense of grandiosity. He feels grandiose. If he lacks empathy, that's inside. He lacks empathy. Not that he appears to lack empathy or he appears to be grandiose. So the only way to really diagnose anybody with a personality disorder or any psychiatric illness is to be inside their head, so to speak, or at least you know, talking, evaluating, and finding out how they think along those lines. So while we show the criterion and the characteristics we see in Trump and others, we were very careful to not diagnose with narcissism narcissistic personality disorder. And that really goes back to the 1964 Coldwater election. We have a whole chapter on that. You don't necessarily need to go in depth in that today, but it talks about the APA, the American Psychiatric Association, decreeing that it's really unethical for psychiatrists or psychologists to diagnose a public figure without evaluating them. So we, we go right up to that line, but we don't cross that line, yeah, in essence. And then I just want to be clear, maybe too, as it might be the right time to interject. You're not as either as the editor or as an author in the book, nor are any of the authors really taking a stand on on a, a political stance on one candidate or another. Exactly and right. I, that was never the intention, and I think that's pretty clear in what you're saying. So between the two things, you know, not taking a political stand and not actually diagnosing any particular person with this, it really opens the the you know, the field to an entirely different interpretation. And so I think that people can read it with an eye to understanding that this is a helpful book to allow them to consider the underlying and often unconscious factors that are actually at work at, at any given moment in time. That's so right. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to mention that I had failed to do that at the beginning, but some of the contributors, which our audience might recognize, are people like Clarissa Pinkola Estes, which is widely known in a lot of circles and is just a really profound thinker and writer. Uh, also James Hollis, Tom Singer, Jean Shinoda Bolin, Lynn Cruz, as we mentioned, Nancy Swift Trilotti, Catherine Madden, and Susan Rowland. And I know a lot of those people. I know you know all of them intimately, and most of them are union analysts. A lot of them are very seasoned dream workers, working with the symbolic, working with Jung's uh, theories and different ideas. And so I think that it's important to remember that we're approaching this not only from a psychological standpoint, but also a depth psychological standpoint. Mm -hmm. And that there is something uh, unconscious here at work that is available for all of us to tap into and begin to be begin to understand not only what's going on in the culture better, but also to understand ourselves better on some level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Far more interesting than the question of does he or does he not have narcissistic personality disorder is really what's going on unconsciously in the United States today, that so many millions of people have been so drawn to a unconventional figure with you know, virtually no political experience and who says at times outlandish things, yet there's millions and millions of people have been drawn to him. What is going on from a depth psychological perspective, I think is a far more interesting question within that. And many of the, the authors you know, really dove into just that, of what are the unconscious themes that they're seeing in the U.S. today and in the world today, you include Brexit and other parts of the planet as well, that are allowing this energy to come forth upon us. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and you bring up such an interesting point about how there are these unconscious factors in the culture that are at work. I wonder if you can talk a bit about what some of the – I mean, I think that this whole election has been so unusual so far. And it's not one that, it's not like anything that people can remember, at least in their lifetime, and certainly that we don't really have documented history about. And of course, there are a lot of factors that change that. It's the accessibility through media and just the right. proliferation of um, Twitter. I mean, that's been such a huge factor in this particular campaign, Absolutely. as well as, as other social media. And even 
all kinds of articles that are passed around on Facebook. And if anybody's involved in social media, you, there's no way you can have missed this. And it's just kind of inundating us. But I think that not only have people really taken notice of this election, and some people are starting to get tired of it, I have to, I have to say, that's pretty obvious. Yep. But I, w I wonder if there are not really some fears that are kind of below the surface that have been activated by this, not mm -hmm. just necessarily because of the candidates. I'm not necessarily suggesting that, but because it's so unusual and different and people really don't know where it's going and have not experienced this kind of, um, I, I guess I should say there's a lot of factors that have shown up along the way that we don't usually see so blatantly, like, like discussions around violence, discussions around just saying the wrong thing at the wrong time. Um, a lot of accusations, a lot of accusations between the candidates of lying and cheating, and that seems to happen in most election cycles. But this one seems to be particularly pretty intense in that way. And mm -hmm. again, not saying either candidate is right or wrong, but it, it's just it's different. So, can you speak a bit to maybe the unconscious fears that are being activated? Yeah, absolutely. And a number of the authors took a stab you know, very much at that. Tom Singer has a delightful chapter in the book where he really masterfully dives into some of those hidden fears and unconscious elements within them. Many of you may know that Tom Singer has written quite a bit on the cultural complex and has for a decade or more. That's really been an area of expertise. One reason why we really wanted him to participate in the book because he's had such a, a history and a depth psychological way of exploring the cultural complex. Cultural complex meaning that while each of us have personal complexes, you know, we might have a mother complex, a father complex, a Peter Pan complex, and we get tripped up with our own personal complexes. A cultural complex is a much broader unconscious complex that a tribe, a nation, a city, uh, a world can be caught up in. And so Many of the chapters, yeah, my own included, we're looking at what are the unconscious complexes that collectively are being activated you know, by this. And the idea of the hidden fears and the unspoken thoughts being tapped into with a release of energy, you know, profound energy at these rallies and some of the violence even was a real key point. Tom's chapter really talks about the Trump campaign being masterful at really hitting some of these core messages that they tap into time and time again, the Make America Great Again, that's embodied on the, the hat itself, the Get Him Out of Here, which is a kind of slogan when hecklers were bothering some of the rallies, he would say, get him out of here, and they would you know, take him out of here. Uh, America First, each one of those is a slogan, but it's really a core message that is tapping into some deep-seated fears or unspoken thoughts that masses of people you know, have that I think is really motivating conscious and unconscious behavior toward a candidate you know, like Trump. If you look at get him out of here, get him out of here is really a core message of get the other out. We're afraid of the other upon us. And that, of course, uh, are Muslims you know, nowadays. You know, he's going to ban billions of Muslims you know, from entering the country. He's going to build a wall to keep the dangerous Mexicans who are rapists and thieves you know, out of our country. He's going to deport you know, millions of people with deportation police. You know, God knows how he's going to do that, but he will. There's this uh, keep the other at bay, the terrorists. He's going to keep the Syrians and the terrorists, you know, all these bad people out with that. So get them out of here is really banning the shadowy, other you know, figure who's not a Caucasian you know, American, American, who's not the status quo in the US that we're fearful you know, of. And particularly when you look at New York City now and, and, and Paris and, and all these you know, large or small you know, terrorist attacks, there is such a fear of the infiltrating uh, evil other who's going to get in and harm me. So we need to get him out of here, get them out of here. And Trump says that, regardless of how politically incorrect it may be, and that may not be a spoken you know, thought that, that the masses have, but it taps into that, that fear, that, that hidden fear. Make America Great Again taps into the fear that our dominance has you know, fallen you know, over the years. Back in the 1950s and 60s, the United States appeared on the top of the world. Our corporations were all over the place, making huge sums of money. Our military was was strong for a while. We had the only nuclear you know, weapon available. 
And slowly, since the 50s, you know, our perceived you know, dominance you know, has eroded with that. That might be good, that might be bad. From the U.S. perspective, you know, we don't like it so much. So the playing field has been leveled. And we've had wars that weren't as clean as World War II. You've had Vietnam and the Iraq wars. So there's been a perceived loss of dominance of the United States. Uh, America first you know, slogan means everybody else is second. So all the other countries need to be second. America needs to be first, and that's tapping into sort of a politically incorrect but unspoken thought uh, or fear that a lot of the populace you know, has. And Tom Singer was saying that's one reason why he just did so profoundly well by tapping into that fear or those fears. He's unleashed you know, just enormous energy around his rallies. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that it's easy for us to go about our daily lives on some level and not consciously think about these things. But of course, again, anybody who has done some study of depth psychology or union psychology is familiar with this concept of the other, for example. Mm -hmm. And the idea that, you know, this is often incorporated with shadow and the things that we can't see about ourselves make us fearful because we haven't been able to integrate them on some level. Exactly. So it's a really interesting example of just how sometimes these kinds of situations push our buttons mm -hmm. and we don't realize it, but we can become quite activated by, by these fears that are just sort of bubbling under the surface. And, mm -hmm. and uh, that's not just Jungian, right? That's, that's Freudian, if you dig right, right into Absolutely. it. Yeah, and and so. several, several other of the pioneers of the depth psychology movement. But mm -hmm. I wonder, it's so easy on some level, I think, to kind of look at Donald Trump and say, you know, it's okay. I, I understand the title of the book is in the era of Donald Trump. So I get that. But I, I wonder if there's some mention of Hillary Clinton and if there's a way that you can parlay some of these underlying fears that she actually activates for us as a culture or as individuals. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's unfair to pin it all on Trump, that, that Trump is the scapegoat in essence of the liberal or progressive you know, people that see him as the shadow, the very thing we're accusing him of doing, of having scapegoats that he's, he's applying the, the shadow onto, you know, Muslims, immigrants, Mexicans. You know, are we not doing the same thing if we label Trump as the you know, main or only problem and were we to not elect him, you know, then everything will be fine. Because it's in the era of Donald Trump, it's in the era where somebody like Trump can rise to the preeminent status that he has and possibly even the presidency um, something is is different in our milieu in in the United States that allows somebody like Trump or Clinton, you know, or really anybody to to rise at that high. The while Trump gets much more airtime, both literally on the televisions, but also in our book, you know, many of the authors, you know, you have indeed, you know, talk about Clinton, you know, Sanders, you know, uh, Cruz, uh, Ted Cruz, and and others, and did not at all let them off the hook, you know, either that narcissism is, is preeminent. It's almost woven into our political structure. Um, the one chapter by Nathan schwartz Salant talks about healthy presidential narcissism versus unhealthy presidential narcissism. And that's acknowledging that narcissism is vital you know, in the, the country in a healthy way. You can't be a world leader unless you're confident enough to rise to the top to think you can you know, control and run the, the country with that. But the... Also, the political system has gone awry. Many people feel that it's so power-based, arrogant, you know, who controls what. Uh, you see that in the division, Democrat versus Republican, the houses can't communicate, and the government shuts down. It feels like that narcissism has woven into all elements you know, of the structure. And Hillary Clinton, and, and even you know, uh, Bernie Sanders, who seemed the least narcissistic of any of them, because he, at least the things he was saying, you know, has to carry you know, a certain level of it. And there's no way you could you become a senator and, and the other accomplishments were you not able to hold some of that narcissism. So you see it in, in all the candidates. You certainly see it in Clinton. Um, however, yeah, Donald Trump becomes the poster child for it or the lightning rod, maybe is a better expression, because he just pulls these controversial statements in so powerfully that it's easier to see uh, within him. Yeah, I, I have to agree with you. I think that he, he is the lightning rod. That's a great term for it. At the same time, you know, is the country prime for that lightning rod? 
So it makes me wonder what's going on sort of under the surface in our everyday lives when there's not an, a major election campaign going on right. that is actually causing us to, um, to look for somebody or something that actually kind of represents these sort of traits that we are looking at and that the book itself is looking at. Right. right. Is, in fact, in the description, we lead with a statement, narcissism is epidemic you know, in this country and, and probably the planet. I don't think the United States alone, although the U.S. has always held that John Wayne bravado, intense you know, energy. So perhaps we're, you know, easier to, to see it within. But it feels like there is an epidemic of narcissism you know, across the country. And many of the authors you know, point to the selfie and the social media as really prime examples of that. The selfie even more so. There's something so narcissistic about holding your arm out or with a stick, and you have a selfie stick, and taking an image of yourself, but then taking 20 or 30 to get just the perfect image. And then we post it to social media, we tweet it, we send it to our friends. And, there, and back in the day when you know, most of us older folks were children, it was impossible to do a selfie. You can aim it right. You can get it you know, there. You have to develop the film. There was no social media to post it to. So when you look at the structure, the fabric of our society that particularly the younger generation is growing up in, individuating you know, within that posting of yourself, who you are, the perfect image, the perfect photos, look at all the fun I'm having on my vacation, look at what I'm doing here, look what I'm doing there. You, we're posting and tweeting inane, silly stuff that who really cares what you have for breakfast, yet you know, those kind of things get posted. So there's a self-reflection that I think we've never seen before. And narcissism, the myth, myth of Narcissus, is of course about the, the pool. He looks in a pool of water, he sees his reflection, falls in love with his reflection, and that selfie screen or the Facebook post, I mean, that's just a mirror, just like ancient Greek and Narcissus you know, saw as well. So there is something I think about this time in history that really spawns this kind of narcissistic tone and feel within our country. Yeah, I agree with you. And on the other hand, or maybe I should say in addition to just like Narcissus looking in the pool, the mirror or the selfie can also be a, maybe an unconscious way that we are seeking context and meaning in our own lives. Because I think on some level, and a lot of us have been doing work around this, we have become so disconnected from something deeper and more meaningful that mm -hmm. you know, we think the meaning in our lives, and I'm being very general, so I have to apologize for everybody that this doesn't apply to you, but the meaning in our lives is often derived from our daily activities. And a lot of times those are really important activities, like how are you gonna make a living? How are you gonna go to work if you don't feel like going to work? How are you going to you know, get your kids to the baseball game or whatever it is? And so. There definitely uh, are, are things that are important, and then there is that deeper something that we don't always take the time to connect with, think about, or even know on some level that we need to be doing that. Now, we all get that on occasion when we're out in nature or maybe hear mm -hmm. poetry or see an image that's particularly striking or something. What do you think about the idea that we are sort of disconnected and that we are actually seeking something to give us meaning and how does that play into the whole narcissism piece of things? Yeah, I think that's well put because the mirror isn't all bad. The mirror is good. When the mirror reflects ourselves, we can A, fall in love with ourselves and just get inflated and grandiose and that's narcissism. Or we can look in the mirror and see reflections of possibilities, of uncertainties, of shadowy pieces, of inspirational pieces. So it's really, what is the mirror activating? Is it a vanity response, which pulls us towards narcissism, or is it a depth psychological, which is trying to peer behind the mirror and what's going on within my soul? The mirror can be reflecting that. I think we're all called to a transcendent experience, which is hard in the daily life, particularly with all the well, tweets and posts and all that social media, but even just life itself, even before all that, all that noise, taking time to reflect and go deep has not been easy you know, for us as humans. But when we do tap into something transcendent, something powerful, the other, when the other isn't the scary other who we need to ban and build a wall to protect us from, but the other is a calling that pulls us into a, a new transcending space, then we're growing, we're individuating, we're going into a deeper 
awareness. It's interesting because we've talked about different kinds of narcissism here. And, and obviously there, you know, if you look at it as a spectrum, some people are going to be farther to the end of that spectrum than other people. And as you pointed out, we all have that. I'm wondering what the opposite of narcissism is. And the reason I, I'll tell you why I asked that question is because I recently saw a post on Facebook and somebody said, oh, I'm so fed up with this. I don't like this candidate. I don't like that candidate. So I'm just not going to vote. And I was, quite frankly, horrified at that because I just thought if you do have an opinion and you really care about what's going to happen in the country, then you need to make a decision and then move forward and, and try to figure out the best way to move that forward. So I was wondering if maybe the opposite of narcissism is actually apathy. And then I thought, well, maybe apathy is actually a form of narcissism because not choosing <laughs> to not make that decision actually is making a decision. Mm -hmm. I wondered if you had a comment on that. Yeah, yeah, I, I like the, those ideas. Yeah, absolutely. Apathy also isn't yeah, the, the answer. I, I can't imagine that. You know, of course, it's tempting to say humility is the opposite of narcissism, but I kind of agree with you that's too easy an answer. I don't see humility uh, as necessarily, particularly because there's often false humility. We're kind of being narcissistic in our humility and we want to be noticed for how humble we are. Um, I guess my opposite of narcissism would be kind of what you were saying before, of a mirroring that, that goes deep with that, a mirroring that is shallow and arrogant and all about me and can't see anything but self. The opposite of that would be community. The Dutch Psychological Alliance, trying to build a community of people. It's not all about me, me, me. It's about community. It's about growing. So it's it would be instead of me and me alone, it's about me, narcissism, it'd be oh, I'm part of a larger community, and how can we share power, and how can we grow together, how can we deepen, how can we welcome the other and not ban or stone or get rid of the other. So it'd be a community-oriented other depth piece. But that's really just me trying to think of how I would say the opposite of it. Um, so yeah, but it, it could be, you go in many directions. It really depends on on what level of narcissism somebody's experiencing and how the the opposite call might be at that particular time. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I am aware of that saying, which I think I had read somewhere in something that you passed on to me, but it's that whole idea that those who don't remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, of course, in our, in our particular field and looking at this from a depth psychological standpoint, we have to look for ways to see how this can all be transformed because I don't think it can be sustained. I mean, it's transforming itself as we speak. It's a very dynamic situation. The topic of narcissism itself is very dynamic because there's always going to be some kind of momentum that's propelling the situation forward in a, in a different way. We are, we're gonna to have to wait a few more weeks from the recording of this to see how the election itself all plays out. But from a depth psychological standpoint, what, what do you think we're learning from this? I mean, how can we, how is this, what is it going to mean in a few months or even a few years from now? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and let me just for a quick moment, go back to that last question uh, briefly, because what, yeah, if you see narcissism as shallowness, you know, then the opposite of shallowness would be depth. So maybe that's the spectrum I would point us towards. Uh, narcissism is virtually always shallow, yeah, and depth is deep. So we we're encouraging somebody to go deep in the mirror versus shallow in the mirror. Um, right, what are we learning from the, this experience? It, one piece that pops in mind is, well, first of all, I'm a clinical psychiatrist. So I just work with patients most of the day, seven to eight hours a day. And this election cycle by far is the most anxiety onsville clinically cycle I've ever seen. I've been doing this nearly 30 years. I've seen a lot of presidential cycles over that time, and none of them have had the level of anxiety. I've got a dozen or more you know, patients that come in with clinical anxiety, can't sleep, you know, shaking, you know, tremor, and a good chunk of that anxiety goes to the news and what they're seeing and what's going on. Many of them are watching way too much TV, too much news, they need to unplug. But I think it tells us the level of anxiety that is out there with this election. The other piece that is somewhat comforting to me is the thought of regardless of who wins, you know, Clinton or, or Trump, or I guess a third party, but probably Clinton or Trump, 
Yeah, the Clinton supporters are terrified of the Trump presidency, and the Trump supporters are terrified of the Clinton presidency. But for those that are terrified of the Trump presidency, I try to reassure them that, yes, I can see why you would have catastrophic you know, fears and some of the things he says could really put you in an anxious state. But who really knows what the secondary and tertiary effects of that you know, will be? Example, as you just mentioned, this is raising narcissism and other psychological elements into the public eye that have never been raised before. The whatever presidential uh, things he accomplishes, good or bad, could really create a secondary backlash and the pendulum could easily swing in a different direction. So one thing I'm learning is that we can't really predict catastrophic events on either side, wherever you are. Then I think probably more directly to answer your question, um, I think it's really, for me, has woken me up to really look at our field from that, well, Tom Singer's cultural complex perspective of I'm so used to working with individuals and their unconscious and their complexes and their depressions and their anxieties. But while I've been aware of, of Tom's work in the cultural complex, this is right in the forefront of, my goodness, what is going on that the country is so moving towards such an unlikely candidate. So the awareness of the collective angst, the collective fears, and that we as a nation and as a planet need to stay tuned into that because those fears and unconscious complexes can really create very strong consequences for us. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And one thing that we haven't really discussed here today is the whole idea of the, I guess you could call it the hero complex and that is, or the savior complex maybe is a better word for it. And that is the idea I think that comes around with every presidential election that we're really looking and kind of desperately hoping as a collective for somebody to come along and save us, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Save, save the country, save us as individuals, save our jobs, whatever is happening for us, save the economy. And, uh, and so, you know, it is interesting to see how these two particular candidates are the ones that have emerged out of all the other candidates that were in this, mm -hmm. this particular race and, and to just wonder why it is that that has happened. And again, it takes me back to how unusual actually both of them are if you start looking at it from an age standpoint, from the, the histories of both of them, you know, they both have a lot of baggage that goes with them. Hillary being the first woman candidate and also having been the, the wife of an ex-president is a very unusual situation. Donald Trump being a business person and coming from that world and not having the political background. I mean, all of these things are really profound. And yet, of course, what happens for me when I start thinking about it all is I come back to this, I mean, the era of Donald Trump, such a, a catchy phrase. It, it says something to me. I suspect it says something to almost everybody. So it's a really brilliant tagline, I think, for the book. But it keeps making me think of the age of the Anthropocene, which some people have been hearing more and more lately. The Anthropocene is really the idea of the age of the human. It's the next era that we are just entering where mm -hmm. humans are central to everything. It's no longer the Pleistocene or the age of the dinosaurs or whatever it is. Humans mm -hmm. are making such a, a profound difference to our planet and when you're looking from an ecological standpoint it's really scary mm -hmm. so what uh, what do you think what stance do you think that narcissism how, how does that relate to our ecological issues and our relationship to the planet because in the end it kind of all comes down to that right no question and you could absolutely apply that age of narcissism yeah era of donald trump perspective to what the heck are we doing to our, our planet that people seem to gradually be awakening to, but it's a slow process. The narcissistic stance to the planet would absolutely be one of just using it, you know, exploiting it to the most ability. If, if we as individuals or as a collective are in a narcissistic space, it's all about me or it's all about us. And it doesn't matter if we you know, strip the earth, the resources, if we pollute the air, it's because it's about me and my profit and, and my company or, or my whatever. So the narcissistic stance would be very almost oblivious to ecological damage that's being caused with that because the narcissistic individual leaves a trail of damaged individuals and systems around them. Nancy Switzerlati wrote a, a marvelous chapter on what it's like living with a narcissist. And you know, she's very self-disclosing her chapter of her marriage and what it was like and, and just how wounding and profoundly difficult it was because the narcissist is so self-focused, he or she 
leaves a trail of, of damage behind them because they're focused on themselves. They're not looking at empathically how their actions are going to affect others. So we as a species or as groups of individuals, if we're in a narcissistic space, clearly we're not going to be aware of the damage we're doing to the environment. Yeah. Your savior comment, I think, is also very well elucidated of to what degree is there a savior hero complex in almost any you know, presidential candidate. With President Obama, we absolutely saw that in enormous ways as he took over. There was a huge sense of he will save us. He won the Nobel Peace Prize before he lifted a finger, which was always odd to me of how to get the Nobel Peace Prize that quickly. Um, but I think it was because the projections, the planet, you know, all of us really, were not all, but those that supported him, which were huge numbers, were projecting the savior archetype onto him. In the time of 2008, when the almost recurrent Great Depression was upon us, so we almost needed a savior. We felt like we did. But President Obama carried that until it tarnished, and then he was almost the Antichrist for so many, and he fell you know, from the highs to the lows. But right now, absolutely, there's a, a savior archetype that is, is affecting the presidential election cycle tremendously. I think both carry that, but Trump carries it in a kind of a unique way. We, we actually use the John Wayne archetype for the particular hero and savior. John Wayne was a savior, a hero. He'd ride in, he'd shoot the bad guys, he'd save the damsel in distress, he'd always save the day. And then we added a General Patton later on. I'm also starting to think the General Patton archetype you know, fits very well. Also, particularly the movie that most of us saw, Dorsey Scott, with this bravado, intense, politically incorrect, I'll take over and just trust me, I'll fix it all. And the well, we actually label it the Trump complex in the book of the the wounds that the collective nation has gone through since 2008, but really since Vietnam and in and, and the last 50 years, but the Twin Towers collapse, the 2008 financial collapse, the decades of war, the terrorists and the Al-Qaeda and, and ISIS and Taliban, all those have so wounded the collective psyche that there's a even more powerful unconscious need for a hero archetype, a John Wayne, a savior, a Trump archetype, that we think embodies the strong man and nostalgia, the nostalgia of the good old days to come back to a time when things were simpler and there was no political correctness and we were dominant in the world, and a strong man to make America great. So that's the Trump complex that he has tapped into and unleashed huge energy because we see that as a pivotal piece of what the United States is really almost possessed by. We're possessed by this Trump complex hero archetype, savior archetype that's propelling us towards these behaviors yeah, and Donald Trump himself. Yeah, and I think you're pointing to something that's really telling about our, our collective culture, and that is that what a lot of depth psychologists are talking about is that how we really need more of the feminine consciousness to come in in mm -hmm. order for us to begin to make the kinds of transformations that we need to make both personally and on a collective level to make our society better mm -hmm. for everyone. And yet, we, we still are just so, again, desperately seeking more of that masculine bravado mm -hmm. approach to mm -hmm. things. And it just makes me wonder, you know, how, how that's all going to shift and, and where that can come in. And, and I have no doubt that the feminine consciousness can come in in different ways. And it is through the mythology, such as your book. I mean, a lot of myths come in through the book and people are using yes. myths to describe and explain certain things. Dreams, uh, of course, symbols, all of these kinds of things are being brought forward in a depth psychological way. So while, while some people might think it's a bit narcissistic to create a book on narcissism. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, the mirror reflected back at me a fair amount of what on earth am I doing? Am I arrogant enough to think I can give this book out in three months? Yeah, but you did. Yeah. 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 But I, I, I just, I'm really grateful actually that you, you had the urge to do it and, and that something prompted you to do it. I think that there's a lot there for people to take away and particularly if you're willing to approach it with an open mind and just really see what we can learn about ourselves as we go about the reading and, and not necessarily to point fingers or use it to label. And, and that's not the intention of the book at all. Mm -hmm. So it definitely yeah. makes me see how we can, we can move forward. And I think that it's wonderful work. And I'm really thrilled to see the, the contributors that you managed to pull together for it because they are all very well educated and, and, and just deep thinkers. And, and that's so important to have that reflective 
capacity mm -hmm. in our culture. That's where it really all begins. And, and again, that might be the opposite of, uh, of narcissism right there too. Right, right, to try to go anywhere. We were amazed that the authors had consented. We, we were shooting for the moon and thought, there's no way these level of people are gonna uh, agree to write chapters. Mm -hmm. But everyone was just right on target and saw the vision. We tried to lead with the vision of, we really think this book needs to come out at this point in time. Are you willing to join? And they all did. It was yeah, amazing. wonderful. Well, congratulations on the book. It's, it's really a, a it. great work. So everybody, I've been talking to Steve Buser, who is a psychiatrist, co-founder of the Asheville Jung Center, publisher of Chiron Publications, who published this book, and also, of course, the co-editor with Leonard Cruz of this new book, A Clear and Present Danger, Narcissism in the Era of Donald Trump. And you can find out more about uh, the book and Steve and also Chiron at either www.chironpublications.com. Of course, Chiron is spelled C-H-I-R-O-N like the mythological figure, uh, or www.trumpnarcissism.com. And there you can also get a free chapter from the book. Steve, thanks so much for spending some time with me today. I really appreciate well, it. Thank you, Bonnie. I really enjoyed it. It's been a delightful time you know, talking with you as well.